So I want you to introduce yourself, your company, and your interest in this topic tonight. So let's start with Adrian. Hey guys, I'm Adrian. I'm, I don't know, but I think I'm the German representative over here. Um, and I'm founder and CEO of Zenken, which is a marketplace on blockchain for carbon credits. Think of like Coinbase or OpenSea for carbon credits, and carbon credits are these certificates that stand for one ton of CO2 either avoided or sequestered. And um, we started, um, I think, like a year ago, um, quickly became the biggest carbon marketplace in the world um, on blockchain, but also on um, off-chain means like 7% of the global carbon market is directly trading, uh, tradable through us. And we just launched something that's called Carbon Forwards. And this is really important because it actually enables people to pre-fund uh, carbon projects around the world. And the first project is a blue carbon project, a mangrove project in Kenya. Um, and yeah, um, maybe also... I was a little bit shocked because the topic changed a little bit. Um, someone told me it's going to be how technology in Web3 can solve the energy crisis, but I take it. That's exactly what we're talking about. That was just a pre... If I had to go through all of that, we'd still be sitting here. But don't worry, you're definitely on topic. So, Tiger, tell us a bit about your business. Hi, yes, I'm Tiger Goldness. I'm the founder and CEO of Trust Solar. Uh, we started in about 2017. Um, we do installations, we're right in the thick of it, um, as it's escalated uh, to what it is now. Um, we also suppliers uh, to, to smaller companies as well, so we both install, installers and suppliers um, in the industry. So they're just tigers everywhere, aren't they? Don't you like these politicians? I didn't even introduce him yet. <laughs> No, but it's true. I mean, we've had two tigers on the street in, in the last week, and uh, now I've got a tiger next to me. My opposite number, Gwede Mantashe, they call him the tiger, or he calls himself the tiger. Um, apparently, it has to do with his bedroom antics, but anyway. Um, so, I'm Kevin Milam. I'm the DA Shadow Minister of e Energy. Um, I do look after mineral resources as well, but uh, my primary focus is on energy. And uh, I guess I'm not the nuts and bolts guys. That's these these three that are, are with me here. I'm the, the big picture, the, the policy, the uh, energy, where it comes from, how we get it to the people, what, what regulations and, and uh, the like that we need to put in place to make sure that it's, it's managed properly and, and that there is a, an affordable solution to South Africa. And that's really what, what I'm trying to do is make sure that we keep the lights on and that we put affordable solutions on the table for every South African. You lost me on regulations, but thank you very much for that. Okay. <laughs> you asked me to do this, right? So, Aaron, you don't need an introduction, but I think we do. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron. I'm a founder of Moment. We've been specializing in putting physical assets on the blockchain and legal contracts on the blockchain uh, for the last two years. Uh, and really, we, we took a call to arms in terms of the energy crisis that we find ourselves within. And we just realized that we couldn't build a tech company in a country that doesn't have electricity to run technology. So uh, although the business was doing quite well in the other verticals uh, that we play in, we decided to focus all of our time and attention into solar and getting solar ownership in the hands of the people. Yeah. That's amazing. Just, just one thing on, on Aaron very quickly. Um, you know, when we talk about NFTs and Web3, there's, we, we all know in that space, there's a lot of BS that happens, right? Lots of BS baffles brains. But what I love about what Moment's doing is that they actually create impact. Whatever they do, there's something tangible that emanates from that, which is, which is why it's always a, a pleasure to be doing this sort of stuff with you. But let's hop right into it. So the African National Congress came out and said, hey, we've got a national state of disaster that we're going to be putting in place, right? And I had lunch with an ambassador today going, what the F are they thinking? Because the last time we had a national state of disaster, all the comrades stole as much from the coffers that they could. So my question is, what the hell is a natural, national state of disaster? How is it going to help us? Now, so you have called for a ring-fenced national state of disaster. I don't know what ring-fenced means. Does that mean only some comrades can steal? 
Um, so, what, 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 I have to get some clarity on this. So, so let's, yeah. let's back up a step. We've had load shedding since 2007. End of 2007 was when load shedding first started. Yeah. We've known about this crisis that, that we were going to run out of electricity since 1998. In the white paper on energy in 1998, government, they, they, they adopted it as policy. And it says, if we don't build new power stations, we're going to run out of electricity by 2007. And that's exactly what happened. So then in 2008, they rushed the building, the tenders for the building of Madupi and Kusile. And everyone knows where that ended up. 15 years down the line, we, we've got two massive, the two biggest coal-fired power stations in the world, hundreds of billions of rands over budget, years behind schedule, neither of them functionally complete. Uh, Kusile has only got one generating unit out of six operating. Madupi's got four out of six operating, I think it is at the moment. Not exactly sure. Um, and they've had uh, unit four at, at Madupi was brought online and a month later it exploded. Now, a lot of this has to do with exactly what you're talking about, Kino, is that the, the corruption and maladministration and incompetence and cater deployment and the like. And it's part of the reason why we're taking the ANC to court over cater deployment. Yeah. So coming to, to, to now, we're 15 years down the line of load shedding and there's been absolutely no sense of urgency from the ANC around the energy crisis in South Africa. And it's only now that the outrage has gotten to a point where we have stage six load shedding on a regular basis, where we've had load shedding every single day this year. It's the first year ever where we've had load shedding every single day. We're already on track for this to be way more than the worst year on record, which was last year. And so there's a sense of urgency, there's a sense of outrage amongst the citizenry of South Africa. People are cutful, they've had enough. And so a state of disaster is an indication that the ANC has finally acknowledged that there is a problem, finally. What we're calling for is a ring fence state of disaster around ESCOM and the electricity sector, okay. which, which basically means that we're not asking that people stay off the streets and that you lock yourself into your, your, your house for three weeks or three months or three years or whatever it might be like the COVID pandemic. What we're saying is that the, the, the regulations and the... the um, procurement processes, and everything that we do in terms of this disaster is very, very focused around sorting out this energy crisis and sorting out ESCOM. It's those two things, sorting out energy crisis, sorting out ESCOM. That's what we want to do. Yeah, I mean, listen, we can go and get into a huge discussion around this, and I will not bore anybody, but um, an interesting fact, way back when, when we talk about Kusile and Madupe, right, the power stations, that you've been talking about, there was one person, one person who was chairperson of ESCOM, and he was also the chairperson of the fundraising committee for the ruling party. What could go wrong? Well, we know. And his name was Vali Musa, and he can sue me if he likes, but I mean, at the end of the day, a fact is a fact, and no court will stop facts from flowing. Just a quick one as well on municipalities. Um, you know, it's, there, there's a follow-up question on this, but I'm going to ask you to be brief. Um, how do municipalities actually free themselves from this burden? So part of what we're proposing that the state of disaster do is to take away some of the obstacles that are in the way of municipalities and independent power producers and installers and the like that, that stops people from installing solar on their roof. Because one of the quickest solutions to solving this energy crisis is to allow people uh, affordable, quick access to their own generation. So we want to take the, 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 the regulatory obstacles out of the way. We want to take some of the financial obstacles out of the way, make it easier, cheaper, and incentivize people to put solar on their roofs. Okay, listen, I mean, absolutely, which is why I'm, I'm amazed, not amazed, I just think it's, why didn't I think of that? Uh, when I heard about what Suncash is actually doing. But, Tiger, let's go to you. Let's just uh, look at this particular question in particular, right? With the right funding, do you think that solar could become a stable source of renewable energy? Because people are also talking about batteries and all sorts of other stuff. I mean, I've had so many discussions with people around solar, and they're going, yeah, but what happens to the batteries at the end? So when we talk about sustainability, that needs to be included in it. So what's your take? Um... Funding is very important with regards to the solar. You know, when we started, it was 
uh, there wasn't many funding models, um, but we knew it was an important factor. Um, and it has progressed. It's got a lot better, obviously. Also, solar's got a lot cheaper. Batteries have got a lot cheaper. We didn't realize that we would need um, backup solutions, especially on a commercial scale, as quick as what we've come to now. You know, we thought we were maybe another three years away from that um, because funding the battery and the solar system and everything wasn't financially viable. But with the downtime um, that the companies and factories are, in, are experiencing, it is becoming viable, um, uh, absolutely. So, and also with the massive increases, I mean, we didn't realize it would jump, the tariffs would jump the way they did. So it's actually becoming to a stage where you could, I mean, not totally off the grid, but at least have a big enough battery bank to last the four hours through load shedding. Of course, in the day, the sun will assist the, the batteries, but if you are a 24 hour business and you need the power at night, um, it's become, you know, a system will pay itself off in four and a half years. And what about the technological advancements when it comes to solar? Um, you know, things have grown in leaps and bounds. Obviously, as you said, the, 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 the cost of, of solar has decreased significantly. Yes. Um, I think a lot of people might disagree, going, I still don't have 250,000 bucks to put something on my roof. But let's talk about that and then also, you know, if, once again, briefly, what the future of solar energy looks like. Um, the, the first question, yes, it has decreased, especially on the batteries, uh, the lithium battery side, and technology has advanced. Batteries charge quicker, um, they have longer warranties, more cycles and so forth, which has made it much more viable. You know, when you're funding a thing, you don't want to fund it over whatever, eight or ten years and find that the batteries aren't going to last that long, where now they do. Um, going forward, um, just adding one thing to the funding. If there were more sort of funding models for the residential uh, sector, that would help a lot, because at the moment it's very much geared to the commercial. And it's not the people that can afford the big, big systems, they've got the money. It's the people that can afford the normal household 150,000 rand system, that's where we need the funding. Um, and that's where the banks need to come, you know, to the party or whoever the funders must come to the party. And going forward, well, the more, we take away from the grid, the more it will assist the grid, which in turn, uh, like the mayor said, will assist the, 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 pure, the poorer communities, you know. Okay, cool, thank you very much. Now, I'm gonna direct my next question to both of you, Aaron, and of course, Adrian as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about the work that you guys are doing to actually make this possible. It's one thing to talk about it, it's one thing to say we have a solution, it's another thing to actually get things done. So let's start with you, Aaron. Yeah, sure. So I think it's just it's so telling that we've got someone who's doing probably the most solar installations across the country. Um, is he talking about financing models and how that's the biggest I need right now? Most of the problems have been solved. Also, thanks to Kevin over here and putting forward legislation that makes it much more viable to feed back into the grid and actually participate here. It's incredible, incredible work. What we haven't fully solved yet is the financing model, and that's what we're trying to do uh, with Momentum, with SunCash. So we launched SunCash in, as an initiative to say, well, why are banks the only ones that can play a role here? Why are banks the only ones that can actually put cash down? And they're generating a, a really, really great return from these solar things. So yeah, we're all sitting in a dire energy crisis, and we're just trying to keep the lights on. The banks are sitting there, you know, the oligopoly that we've got in the country, it's four or five major banks, they're going, oh, wow. We're going to print money. That's like, that's, <laughs> that's like how they're, they're feeling right now. And um, I think also one of the other topics that we touched on was corruption and uh, transparency of the flow of funds. There's never been a better marriage between two different technologies, I believe, than solar and blockchain. Because now what you can do is you guys can all fund the solar installations. You guys can all make the return on those solar inst installations. Like we said, they'll pay themselves off in, in four to seven years. After that, it's, it's, all, it's all profit from a, from, a, from a system like that with some maintenance and insurance baked in. Um, and because we're doing it on the blockchain, it's all transparent. So you can see we've done an installation and again, talking to, we're not just, this is not just ideas. Um, you know, uh, we've, we've got an installation on, uh, uh, or some cells on Dalmas High School We've got some cells on Tafelsia, which is here in Cape Town. 
these are, they're installed. People have already bought these cells uh, and they'll be getting their first uh, payouts very, very soon. Um, so really, I think for us, it's about doing real things, bringing it to market, uh, and enabling a democratized way of enabling this funding. Cool. Adrian? So I can't tell a lot about solar, but we feel the energy crisis, and that's the reason we think it's bad. But the environment is of way worse. It's way harder to fund it. Most banks, they wouldn't even look into funding um, the environment, but we don't feel it directly. I mean, it comes slowly, uh, slowly and it creeps into it, but it's really hard, the financing. And why is that? Because it's completely opaque. So there's no transparency, and I think even worse than in the solar um, uh, um, uh, uh, vertical. So um, that's where we actually come and play, and we basically create a really transparent market um, and the transparent market is really important because if you don't have a transparent and then also liquid market, no institutional investors or no banks will, will come because what happens if you, and that's where, in the space where we are, when you fund a climate project, um, of course some people do it because um, uh, philanthropic reasons, but I think you can't scale funding into climate if you just look out of uh, philanthropic reasons. You need to implement it into the economy. You have to implement into capitalism, and it sounds bad, but you can't change a system just from one year or the other. Like capitalism, it takes forever, and so you need to figure out how can we implement nature in all sorts of transactions that we do and make them regenerative. And um, if you create a system like that, then there will be funding flowing towards climate um, projects and also to things that could even be like, for instance, renewable energy certificates, where you then basically also fund projects like these. And that's what we're doing. Excellent, thank you very much. Now, at this particular point, I'm gonna open up to the floor. So if you've got any questions to the panel, please put your hand up, I'll come to you, give you the mic, and we can get rocking and rolling. So while you're thinking about it, I might come and choose a question as well. So. If you give me good eye contact, I normally don't come to you. If you look down at your phone, I normally do. Um, what does this mean for ESCOM, though? Are we suggesting that we just allow ESCOM to implode and no longer exist? Can the country live without an ESCOM? Or is this a great way of taking the load of ESCOM and spreading it so that they can do the necessary maintenance and other stuff that they need to. So, let's start with you. I think that's exactly the point, is that, first of all, we need to acknowledge that ESCOM is in a death spiral at the moment. They are basically bankrupt. They owe 400 billion rand in debt. Um, they can't build more power plants. They can't upgrade the grid. And these are things that they desperately need to do. So we've got to give them some space to, to recover. And we can only do that. Part of the reason why we have load shedding is because our, our power plants are old. When I say they're old, the, the majority of them are more than 30, 40 years old. And that means that they're falling apart. They're held together by spit and chewing gum. And, and so you've got to, to, to switch off a generating unit, you've got to be able to, to turn on something somewhere else and, and take some of the load off. And that's exactly where going off grid um, or, or going grid connected with solar or the like um, allows you to ease the burden on ESCOM. Now, ultimately, what, is, what does the future look like? Well, I think it looks like a, an ESCOM that's split, where what ESCOM's primary role will be will be the transmission of electricity. And, and generation will be independent power producers, it'll be solar farms, it'll be wind farms, it'll be self-generation and the like. Um, but, but ESCOM won't be in the generation game. Maybe Kuburg, maybe one or two of the, the newer plants, but the bulk of it will be uh, smaller generation and, and independent power producers. So they will focus on, on transmission. The distribution will be handled by municipalities. We've got a way to go to get there, but ESCOM's going to be with us for the foreseeable future. I mean, we, we, we don't have the, the spare capacity to switch off ESCOM tomorrow. We've got to keep ESCOM alive. So I have two questions. Um, oh, my name is Nicole Merkin and I'm the founding director of Fight Back South Africa. I have two questions, uh, one being for Man from Parliament and the other two perhaps for Trust Solar and the Suncash Initiative. 
My first one is President Ramaphosa announced on Monday that um, they're obviously affecting a national state of disaster around our energy crisis. How concerned do we need to be that this is just going to result in more money being funneled into the wrong pockets? So I, I would like a, an idea of that from a parliamentary perspective and what perhaps could be done to uh, put, you know, what, what checks and balances can be put in place to prevent that from happening. And then for Trust Solar, uh, Trust Solar and, um, and for Sun Cash Initiative, these are amazing ideas that you're speaking about. Do you perhaps have a example, a local example, something that you can share with us, something that you're doing in the Western Cape, just so we can visualize this. What are the use cases for this right here, right now? Who are you speaking to? Um, I think that would really help us get an idea of, of what's possible. Yeah. Thank you. I'll let Kevin go first. Thanks. Um, throw me in the deep end, eh? Um, okay, so, so first of all, we need to monitor exactly where any funding in a state of disaster goes. What happens when a state of disaster is declared is that they basically allow things to be purchased without following normal processes. It releases an amount of disaster management funding. And we're looking at, at that disaster management funding. It's, it's, there's not a lot. I mean, we're talking, I think it's six billion rand. Now that doesn't, that, that might sound like a lot, but essentially that's two months of diesel supply for ESCOM. Um, but ESCOM doesn't have money to buy diesel at the moment, which means that they can't run their peaking power plants, which means that, that we are essentially two stages of load shedding higher than we should be if we were able to buy diesel. So we're saying, okay, let's take that contingency reserve, the disaster management funding, and use it to buy diesel for ESCOM and make sure that that's what it's used for. And, and that, that's the short-term use of it. Slightly longer term from a disaster management perspective is the procurement processes that allows them to go and bypass some of the localization requirements, some of the BEE requirements, some of the procurement regulations that say you have to get three quotes if you want to buy a, a Phillips screw to put into the, the transformer that's blown kind of thing. Um, we want to make it easier for ESCOM and municipalities to repair their infrastructure. But we've got to monitor this quite closely. So what the DA is proposing is, first of all, that there be a special inspector general whose sole job, and it must come from the Department of, of Finance, from the National Treasury, their sole job must be to monitor the spending of disaster management funding and, and procurement processes. And the second thing that we're proposing is an ad hoc parliamentary committee to oversee the disaster management process because we don't want to go back to the situation we had during the state of disaster in COVID where we, we had all sorts of bizarre regulations like you can't buy closed toed shoes, uh, sorry, open toed shoes, and you can't buy roast chickens and things like this. So we want to make sure that, that the regulations and things that get put in place are logical, that they're properly administered, and that they are enforced appropriately. Cool, and then um, maybe to speak to one of the, the local uh, initiatives that we're looking at. So the, the next one that we're looking at doing is a safe house for uh, gender-based violence victims. Um, and uh, this is really, really such an important point because you're looking at, a, at a, a place where women have undergone enormous trauma, right? And it's a safe house for women and children. And now they're sitting in a house that's supposed to bring them comfort and it's supposed to bring them uh, a time of healing. And then all the lights go out. Security cameras are not working. The electric fences are not working. There's no light. Like, you have to put yourself in the shoes of these individuals. The level of PTSD and stress that you're feeling when you literally know that you're running for your life and you have restraining orders against individuals, you're fearing for your life, right? So, I mean, there's so many levels of damage that the, the load shedding is, is causing to South Africa, this is on a human level, right? There's levels where, you know, farmers are throwing out hundreds and thousands of litres of milk or fruit or whatever it may be, your cold storage is, is being broken. Um, but yeah, this is one of the, the use cases that we're looking at doing next and, and tokenizing that so that individuals can invest in bringing a solution to the safe house and so that they can always have power and always have safety. Uh, and thanks to the, the legislation, and it's in the Western Cape, we can actually go and install more solar on that, those rooftops than what they require. So let's say, for example, they require 60, 60 kilowatts, we can install for 120, we can feed back in the grid, and we can make this profitable for uh, the philanthropists and for the investors who, who funded the installation uh, for the safe house. Um, to answer your question, 
ESCOM is not going away. Obviously, we need ESCOM. How can we help the situation by obviously taking some of the, the usage away or, or need of electricity away by putting on solar systems? But also, there's a lot of roofs, like schools, um, factories that don't necessarily use all the, 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 the power that they can generate on those roofs. They can be fed into the grid. And that regulation sometimes is, you know, it's very sticky. It's, uh, Cape Town's been very proactive with that, at least, um, and have been for a while. But up until quite recently, you could only, uh, you could feed into the grid, but only to bring it back again, not overproduce to the extent that they'll owe you money. But we have lots of roofs. Like I say, schools is one of them, um, factories, they're all over the show that can produce power and feed the grid. Houses, most houses in the day, by 10 o'clock in the morning, the batteries are charged and the whole system throttles itself for the rest of the day. And to feed the grid, you need a bi-directional meter and there's a whole story behind that um, which can also produce power. So if they can help with those regulations and just make it a little bit easier, I know. Um, I know there's also technical things that, you know, you can't put a massive system on if you don't have the in, uh, right size incoming lines and so forth. But, but that is something we need to work on because we'll help ESCOM um, by not only taking away some, but we'll be providing the grid with power. And there's so much of it, honestly. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jean Pierre I'm from a Cape Town based company called African Data Technologies, focusing on sustainability solutions. Um, I think I've got two questions. Just firstly, one to Adrian because they did something very interesting quite recently around business model innovation in the carbon space. So, Tiger, you mentioned that we need to fund solar at homes. You mentioned regulations, and I'm guessing that's quite a big aspect of that. Any other? ideas around how would we do that? How do we de-risk that for banks? You said banks must come to the party. And then Adrian, if you could just maybe touch on carbon futures and what that is, and just tell us a bit more. I think it's quite a great topic. Thanks. Um, yeah, the, the residential finance, I think, is going to be a key factor um, going forward. And it doesn't necessarily have to be banks. Um, like in the, the commercial sector, there's a lot of private funders that aren't as sticky, they don't need as much info to approve a transaction. And if we could have something along those lines um, for the residential sector, it will be a really big help, honestly. Can I just come in on that for a second? Yes. So one of the things that the DA is proposing is a 75,000 Rand tax rebate. You put a solar in installation on your roof and you present the invoice when you do your tax return and you get 75,000 Rand off that coming back straight out of the tax that you would normally pay your income tax. That's one of the things we are proposing. So yeah, when I looked at the um, whole solar thing, I always thought like blockchain is an incentivization machine, right? And a trust machine. And if I look at um, what is needed, you need a lot of incentives. You need to punish certain kind of actions and you need to reward certain kind of actions. And I think if you then also have the regulatory frame um, uh, like worked out, then it can be beautiful. You can create um, crazy things. And that's also what we are doing, um, for instance, in the climate space, because we, um, first of all, I, I did like road trips to Southern Africa, and I realized that a lot of um, carbon projects, so climate projects, are already happening. And um, because it's so opaque, so intransparent, um, mostly only like 10 to 20 percent of the actual funding arrives at the project itself. Um, why so? Because there's no real incentive to actually have it transparent. Uh, it, 
it's just not there. And um, the other thing I realized is there is so much, so much uh, um, land, there's so much also um, workforce, but the funding is missing, not only for, for solar, but also for climate projects, but it's just not interesting. And that's the reason, um, uh, as you said, we put something on the blockchain called um, Carbon Forwards, where you basically now fund a project, and then in two or three years' time, let's say a project could be a forestation project, and a company starts with a forestation project and you fund it now, and then in three years, um, when the trees are standing, or five years, um, and they actually sequestered already CO2 out of the atmosphere, um, this forward you invested in, let's say for instance for $5, now turned into a carbon credit, which is worth, let's say, $20, and is really interesting for corporates around the world in order to compensate for their emissions. And of course, for institutional investors, that's super, super interesting because they know all these net zero claims of all these companies around the world, they're going to hit them. And not only for companies, also for governments, um, for countries, they have net zero goals. And I can promise you most of them will not solve them and they will not reach them. So they have to f figure out how can they funnel money into climate projects around the world. And before, all these um, deals happened over the counter means basically, and no joke, all the, all the deals happened over phone. It was literally um, someone calling, hey, I need some forestation credits. Can you, can you procure some? And that's how the whole market worked out before. And then it's no wonder only 10% um, arrived. And then the other thing is 90% of these climate projects are in the um, global south. And 90% of the buyers of these carbon credits are in the global north. And if you create um, a transparent um, infrastructure for that, where these incentives are in place, then you can create a beautiful um, structure in order to fund these projects around the world. And you were talking about local use cases. We, for instance, now have a project um, right next to the Kruger National Park, um, a forestation project. And um, it's, it's crazy how um, quickly you get um, institutional investors um, uh, uh, motivated to go into these projects if you show them that there is a transparent market where not 90% is wasted um, through intermediaries or something and then the end can sell these um, credits with a win but on the other side also had a really good impact on, on the planet. So could I quickly ask you just one quick question Please. and then I'm, I'll answer Kino's question is uh, so you guys have introduced transparency and you've introduced an open free market right, that has produced a level of growth, right? You tell us, like, what has that growth trajectory been? Like, give us a number. Like, percentage, ARR, like, what does that growth look like? For who? For Senken. For us? Yeah. Um, so I think first, two things. I think it's quite crazy. Um, the return of investments of these forwards is nowadays in the area of, like, 30% a year for institutional investors yeah. because um, the, the growth is... It's just happening, like the demand for um, um, CO2 actually taken out of the atmosphere is like crazy. Um, for us itself, um, I mean, I just said uh, before, 7% uh, we, we, of the global carbon market is tradable through us. Big. And why? Because before all these uh, exchanges and so on, they had to build up their own inventory which is always a friction. You have to buy something somewhere, you have to put your margin on top, and then you charge, uh, you sell it again for like 20%. But you have a lot of cost with that. So what we actually created through blockchain is that whenever there is a supply of a carbon credit somewhere, let's say a, a developer has a credit in their registry or some other protocol, maybe even you at a certain point have it sitting there, we directly can access that infrastructure because in the blockchain, it's permissionless. Means like, as I mentioned before, blockchain is a trust, trust machine, right? Because I can trust you that this has certain kind of um, date, underlying data and um, a buyer can see that as well. So can access that directly. Yeah, and it's, it's immutable, right? Like no one can go and fudge that afterwards. And I think this is, this is again, so where I want to bring that to is we see a model in Germany working, right? Working to great success. We can take that exact model here to South Africa and look at all of the points that individuals are speaking about here, South Africa uh, is less concerned about 
climate, right? So there's a huge need in, in Europe and there's targets that have to be met. I think we all sort of realize Africa produces like 3% of the carbon emissions of the world. We're less concerned about that slightly. If, if you look at the per capita in South Africa, it's one of the worst countries in the world. So we need more renewable energy as well, right? But, so we, take, we can take that exact same model for solar and introduce layers of trust, of transparency, of open free market trade. And I think it's clear, seeing how the model works, that it will produce a, a drastic sort of increase in the rollout of solar and solving the energy crisis that we have here. And then, like you say, there's also the opportunity on top of that to look at renewable energy certificates on the solar that you're producing, right? So you're solving an energy crisis, and then you've also got additional funding mechanisms. And like you said, majority of that market is in the global north. Uh, that's a mechanism for us as South Africa to bring, to bring capital into the country, right, from, from all over the world, uh, and to help them address their needs uh, and meet their targets but at the same time bring capital into our country and accelerate our economic growth and our, our uh, infrastructure outlay. So to answer the question that, that Kino asked, like how does it work, right? Like how, explain it like a five-year-old, I'll try. Um, essentially, we tokenize every solar cell that's installed. So when you're buying this thing, you're actually buying a real solar cell. You're not buying shares in a company, you're not buying a, an ETF or something complicated, you're buying a cell. And that cell produces electricity that someone pays for who do they pay for that electricity? They pay you because you own the cell. So that's how it works. The payouts are done through a smart contract. So the smart contract just goes, it's, it's a very simple smart contract that says, who owns all of these assets? All right, I'm gonna divide the payment up to those guys. And because it's on chain, it's all transparent, it's all uh, uh, put there. Um, you can see exactly what solar cell you own, where it's situated. The legal contracts that enforce your ownership of that cell are actually embedded into the metadata of that token. So, and that's enforceable in 160 jurisdictions around the world, right? It's ownership of property. It's a very old class of law. It's very well supported. Um, so I think those things are important. And one other thing that I think is important to point out is because it's on chain and because it's on the blockchain, uh, it's a lot more resilient. If Moment were to shut its doors down tomorrow, do people lose their assets? No. They still have their assets. They're still on chain. The smart contract is still deployed and payments can still continue. So I think that's a really important factor to, to consider when thinking about, uh, you know, investing in something like this. Okay, great. Any other questions? There we go. Just once again, an introduction and the question. Thank you. Hi, my name's Cara. I'm an attorney at Skriptaka Hofmeyer. I was just wondering, how is this different from, for example, Sun Exchange? So I understand you guys work on the blockchain, but other than that, it kind of sounds like Sun Exchange. Sure. So actually, uh, Sun Exchange are the developers of the Dalmas and Tafelsia projects. So we bought an allocation of cells from the Sun Exchange. So uh, it's a layer on top of them in, in these cases. Um, the reasons why it's immensely different is because they're tradable. Uh, when you invest in, and, and really we, we admire and look up to the Sun Exchange, they've, you know, they've pioneered this model from, from a while ago or a similar so sort of model. But you invest in and your capital sits there and you're stuck there, right? With this model, you can own a solar cell, earn an income for two or three years and then decide to sell it or trade it, you know? Maybe you could do some analysis on the Northern Cape versus the Western Cape and, and sell your Western Cape cells to get some Northern Cape ones because you've analyzed the weather patterns and they'll get better yields or whatever. Those sort of things become possible um, when you put it on chain. So uh, the Sun Exchange model doesn't put solar cells on chain at all. It just allows collective um, sort of funding into uh, solar installations. Uh, but really, really great model, you know, sort of building upon uh, the groundwork that's already there. Uh, hi, good evening. My name is Neil. Um, I'm just an independent freelancer. Uh, Mike, I would like to just hear um, perhaps a bit more about like what the characteristics are of solar assets in particular. Uh, which is different to like other infrastructural assets that institutions might need, which is causing the traditional financing institutions to fail to provide the needed finance. Um, th th thank you. That's more a financial <laughs> question. Um, I actually don't know. It's it's you know it's adding value to a property. Um, and generally people that need the finance are 
you know, let's go back to the residential side again. Um, they own the house. They're not exactly going to put a solar system on a house that they're renting. So they're generally homeowners, stable, and I don't know why the banks haven't come up with something or private funders for them. Um, on the commercial side, the banks are very keen. You know, it's, it's like you say, the return is 30 plus percent compared to whatever the banks are giving, eight, nine percent. Uh, so they're too keen to throw money at, at solar projects. Yep. So I don't know so why on, on I, the I can touch on side. maybe, um, you know, we had a very interesting conversation with some individuals at uh, Investec, and it's not necessarily that the banks don't want to fund these things. I think there are challenges when you're dealing with a residential situation, uh, and there's, um, you know, financing that, there's a lot more hurdles that you want to go through and checks and balances you want to do on an individual. But uh, even the banks have limitations to the amount of capital and, and risk that they can take. So it's not that they're not financing these, they are. Uh, I think Investec is financing uh, solar projects to the value of 800 million to 1.3 billion uh, very, very regularly. But there's a finite amount of capital that they can outlay and take risk here. You have to realize banks have tons of other activities that they're, that they're involved in. And the sheer volume of capital or finance that we need in order to solve this problem is immense. Far more immense, I think, than what the banks can actually uh, put together right now and, and maybe more immense than the risk they're willing to take right now. You can speak to the, the quantum. Yeah, so I think it's a bit of a grudge purchase. It's like insurance. Um, you, you don't really want to, to put in battery backups and solar panels and things like that in case the lights go out. So I think that's one aspect of it. But I do also think that, that one of the challenges that we face is, and, and this is something that is, is certainly being dealt with right now here in the city of Cape Town, um, is, is, is the fact that feed-in tariffs, where you produce more than you need, and you're now going to get paid for what you produce, exactly what, what, what uh, these gentlemen are talking about, uh, have not been attractive. So the feed-in tariffs have not been worthwhile for, for anyone to invest money in, in solar uh, more than, than the bare minimum of what they need. So that's the first issue, is we need to, to push feed-in tariffs to a point where they are attractive and there's a return on your investment. The second factor that, that we need to look at relates specifically to, to the issue of up until now, and Cape Town is the only place where this is, is not true anymore, uh, you had to be a net consumer of electricity. In other words, you had to use more than you produced, that you, than you fed back into the grid. So that's changing. That's changing right now here in Cape Town. I'm busy proposing a, a private member's bill in Parliament. That it's, it's basically the solar incentive bill to, to force government to roll this out across all municipalities to make it easier for any resident anywhere in the country to do exactly what, what is being done here in Cape Town. Is it on? Oh. Um, sorry, I actually work with uh, Kevin. I'm a member of the National Assembly and I serve on the energy portfolio with him. Um, but the reason why I'm actually just, I want to ask Aaron this publicly is because it's actually quite important. Um, under Article 9 and Article 13 of the Paris Agreement of 2015, um, historic Western Misses, the most of the Western countries that are responsible for the climate crisis, um, they have a obligation to mobilize financing to the tune of $100 billion a year. Um, and it hasn't really happened. But, you know, when I, listening to you and the challenges you're facing with finding the capital you need to do this in what, you know, to all intents appears to be the, the fastest way to decarbonize our economy. And I don't really have much faith in, in relying on the present national government of doing this. So the, the best way to do this is actually through, you know, the mechanisms that you're setting up. Um, have you made any approaches to foreign governments? Has there been any interest in doing so? And to what extent can we create like almost like an international marketplace where people can directly invest in what you're doing? Because if we can't rely on sovereign governments to do this, then we have to allow the public to enable the mechanisms by which we can save our planet. Great, great, great question. Um, pulling out the, 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 the Paris Act over there. Um, so uh, no, we haven't uh, approached any, any, any governments for, for funding yet. So that's a really, really great point. And thank you so much. 
Um, we've been uh, financing this through uh, uh, raising capital through traditional VC mechanisms um, and through revenue generation on you know the the alternative asset side of our business. So absolutely, that's something that we we need to explore. Thank you so much. I also um, in the com space there's something called and it's under the um, Paris Agreement Article Six is the ITMO, so International Transferable Mitigation Outcomes, and um, it's once again, it's the um, governments who haven't been completely, uh, or haven't agreed upon it, but it's now implemented. So for instance, we're supporting a project in Senegal where basically the Swiss government is paying for waste disposal and landfills in Senegal um, under the Article 6 already as a, as a first um, like primer, so to say. So I think there are things coming up, but it's, it's again, it's uh, that they haven't agreed on a lot of things um, under the certain kind of articles. And I don't see it changing, to be honest, because I, I've seen all the UN conference, all the COPs, and it's a mess, and yeah. Right, right. Next question. Hi, I'm Sebastian from an uh, e-commerce syncing, data syncing company called Storehub. Um, my question is to uh, Adrian. I don't know too much about uh, carbon credits and the jurisdictions that you know, the company's based in and you know, where they derive the, the benefit from, but can a company in you just kind of briefly touched on it. Can a company in Switzerland approach your company and get carbon credits from a jurisdiction that's outside of the framework that the company is incorporated under? Yeah, so first of all, from science, it doesn't matter where you take the CO2 out of the atmosphere. It doesn't matter. So first of all, from science um, point of view, and then yes, they do, um, they can come to our platform. And I think most of our, like, I think every single project um, on our platform is in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and I think I would say 99% of our um, users are either in Europe or in the US. So it definitely is possible. But also there are a couple of different markets um, in this whole um, carbon space. Which, and it makes it really complex because there's on one hand a market where corporates by law have to buy these allowances, in, they're called, and um, there it's, they have to go to the national market. So for instance, in Europe there's a national market and all the heavy polluters, like for instance, all the companies in the chemical, in the metal, or in the energy producing industry, they have to um, buy allowances from the European market. And the companies beside these heavy polluters, they are in the voluntary market, and that's where we are, and there they can buy from wherever these projects are. So the international ones, only discretionary offsets and not required. Exactly. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Michael Weiss, and I am involved in the tech and startup scene between the continents, actually. So we raise funds from Europe to drive into the local ecosystem and work with local companies to showcase the great and amazing stuff that is happening here on, on the continent. And uh, one aspect that I would love the panelists to uh, talk about is the obvious potential of job creation through the projects uh, that you're doing. So just maybe for, for some aspect of creativity, uh, give us some ideas actually what can be funded through these offsets with a solar aspect, the installation components is, is quite obvious. So that one, and um, Adrian, now as you coming from Germany, being here on, on, on the ground, maybe there are some ideas that you're already seeing, wow, these are potential projects that could really bring some great potential. And now as we having some great representatives here, you know, also from, from Parliament, it's like, what do you guys need? What is, where do you see this going and what would be of great help to drive these initiatives even further that I'd be very interested in? Oh, amazing question. So, um, first of all, like, even I'm German, we have our office here in Cape Town and also in Berlin though, but um, also over here. Um, and with these carbon credits, um, normally you always, or like really often you only talk about CO2 actually sequestered or avoided, but actually, and that becomes more and more important, are all these co-benefits around the carbon credit. That could be job creation, for instance, like we have one mangrove project in uh, Senegal um, where they created 550 jobs, um, just planting mangroves, keeping them up, doing the science around it, and um, the same with other projects. I think most of the projects, and it's probably the same for the solar um, world, 
always have job creation as a core benefit. There are others, like for instance, creating biodiversity um, through forestation or something like that, or along all the UN sustainable development goals, I think a lot of these are actually um, coming along with these carbon credits. And it's quite interesting that if you look at the value of a carbon credit, that the carbon is actually only a small part. More and more the co-benefits become more important um, than the actual carbon, and the carbon credit is only used as a vehicle to actually fund a lot of social impact next to it, because the world somehow decided that this is the the, the vehicle we uh, we can all agree upon, um, uh, also on governments and so on. And what we need is, I, I mentioned it before already, is like um, clarity from governments and um, different kind of institutions on how these carbon credits are treated on national level, but then also on local level, because there's no agreement, and that actually is really bad for getting institutional investors into the space because I think it's the same for solar panel. The more risk there is involved and the more insecurity in that space is involved, the less interesting is it, it is for institutional investors. And investors and banks, they only care about return of investment. Um, and if there's a good, a good investment opportunity, they will invest. If it's solar, then they will invest. Actually, they don't care. They just want to make money. So here's, here's the thing on that. Um, first of all, Unemployment in South Africa is the highest in the world. That's a fact. We have the highest unemployment rate in the world. So we've got to do everything we can to get our economy growing. Part of that is keeping the lights on. But, but we have an opportunity here, and it's this. It's exactly this. Right now, Tiger can probably speak to this, but we have an unprecedented demand for solar installations. We need installing technicians. We need maintenance technicians. It's not just solar electricity, it's solar geysers. Because every solar geyser you put on takes one electrical geyser off the grid. And so we've got an enormous opportunity to create jobs and create that just energy transition that everyone's talking about. Moving away from, from fossil fuels and, and, and coal-based, primarily, uh, electricity to what we're talking about here. It's about skilling people up getting them working, giving them decent uh, employment, and, and creating an economy that, that grows going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And if I could just touch on that as well, not only do we create a ton of jobs, but we also create so much economic value. Or not create economic value, we stop the loss of so much economic value. Um, I mean, Cape Town specifically, we can see how many Germans are in the room, is a prime location for remote work or to, to, to work from outside of your country but you're a lot less incentivized to do that when you can't have Wi-Fi and when you can't get on your Zoom calls and when you can't do business, right? So as long as we keep the lights on, we remain an attractive prospect for uh, outsiders to come and visit our beautiful, beautiful country. Like, South Africa is incredibly gifted. We have the most resilient people. We have resilient business. We have beautiful, beautiful uh, nature. Uh, we have, like, some of the best beaches in the world, for example. We are a prime location. And not having power feels like such, such an undercut. You know, it's like the, the rug is being pulled out from under you when you have all of this potential. Uh, so really, yeah, I, thank you. All right, I'm gonna, I might have one or two more questions. Hi, uh, Kristen Engelier from the Cape Argus. I'm a journalist and I cover environment and energy, and sometimes politics matters. Um, so just in the age of the worsening energy crisis in South Africa. This has definitely accelerated the uptake of solar energy. I have two questions. What would, what would the uptake of solar energy have been if that didn't happen? Just out of curiosity. And then also, what is the full potential of solar power in South Africa? I know right now it's being used, um, it's being used to assist, like everyone's mentioned, to alleviate to alleviate the pressure on the power grid, but what is the full potential of solar power in South Africa? Like, does it have the potential to power the country? Does it not? And if not, then what is its potential in South Africa specifically? So from my perspective, I would say absolutely yes. And the, the, I, I can't answer the question on what the uptake would have been like if we didn't have this energy crisis. I still believe there was already a strong push towards solar energy. Uh, there's numerous benefits to solar. Um, it's, a, it's a renewable energy source. Uh, you know, 
it's free energy until the sun decides to send us an invoice for all of its hard work. Um, so I think there still would have been an uptake, but of course it's been accelerated now. The potential is immense. Uh, I believe, uh, and I hope I'm not wrong on this one, but in our research we found, uh, I'm from the Northern Cape, Kimberley, small little uh, mining town. Uh, the highest solar efficiency in the world that you can get is in the Northern Cape. It's effectively a 50% efficiency rating because the other 50% of the time the sun is down. Like, <laughs> you can't get better than this, right? Uh, we, like I've said before, South Africa has an abundance of many things, you know, people, resources, minerals. Sun is also one of those things that, that Africa has an abundance of. Uh, land is something that we have an abundance of right now. Uh, a young population is something that we have an abundance of right now. All of these factors are like ingredients mixing, mixing in a pot for, for an incredible, incredible solution. And I believe that not only would it solve the, the crisis that we're in right now, but it will help us leapfrog much of the rest of uh, the world into a new standing where we have decentralized, resilient energy infrastructure that, uh, you know, I mean, central power structures are just a bad idea, uh, like straight up. America uh, underwent this very recently. They had an attack on one of their power stations. Very simple attack. Somebody shot it with a gun and their power went down. Central power stations are not a good idea for resilient energy in a country. Solar is completely decentralized. If you have solar in your house, somebody else's power infrastructure gets shot, you've still got power. You know, that's, that's the reality of it. I just want to pick up on the potential. Vietnam in 2019-2020 incentivized the rollout of rooftop solar. And they did it through the feed-in tariffs, they did it through uh, incentivizing installations and the like. And they put a, a limited time window on it. In six months, they added 8.6 gigawatts of electricity onto their grid. In fact, they've now got more than they need in Vietnam. And in South Africa, our shortfall right now is between four and six gigawatts. So if we could do that, we could essentially alleviate the pressure on ESCOM enough to allow them to do the repairs, to make sure that we don't have load shedding, and to, to come back to your question about is there, enough, is there enough solar to power everything, you know what, if we can just alleviate that, that gap, ESCOM's power stations, it's coal power stations, Kuburg, the gas power stations and the like, will then pick up the slack and, and uh, manage the, the industrial demand and the like. I think there's also quite interesting picture. Um, where it shows like how much solar um, panels do we need in order to power the whole world and they put like a square in the Sahara Desert and if you take that square it fits quite easily on uh, Northern Cape and it's only a part of the Northern Cape so actually South Africa would have the power to or the, the resources to power the whole world so that's I think an easy answer yeah. If, um, yeah. Coming back to your, your uh, question even if there wasn't load shedding, and perfectly cool wouldn't have load shedding, uh, it would still be viable to do solar because of the cost benefit. Electricity and tariffs are going up at a radical rate. It's cheaper to pay off a solar system, a grid tire solar system, um, than pay for the electricity that it generates. So that's where we're at. It's actually a no-brainer for a company to put solar on at the moment. That's where we're at. Hi, my name is uh, Ronnie Vogel. I'm also from Germany, uh, from Munich, actually. I live here with my family and uh, we love South Africa since 25 years. I've funded a few startups in the country and um, my, I want to put a few thoughts up into this panel. Um, probably a bit more like sort of bring some, some ideas in, into, into that. Uh, yeah, uh, very complimentary panel. Thank you for that. First of all, this whole evening wouldn't have happened if ESCOM would be still up and running. Yeah, so thank you, ESCOM. <laughs> uh, secondly, um, uh, through that whole crisis, we all get together, become creative. Uh, all those smart brains in the room and on the panel creating new ideas. It drives the transformation forward. We all need transformation speed, and that's happening right now. So we're looking back in 10 years time, 20 years time, we say thank you ESCOM for making this country be one of the big energy producers in the world. 
Why shouldn't South Africa, Namibia be Saudi Arabia of the future? Why shouldn't we be one uh, of the big hydrogen producers of the world? I mean, solving big energy problems. And we know hydrogen is probably the fuel of the future. Uh, we're talking about uh, how to store energy. You know, at the moment we have, you know, sun between six and 12, 12 hours a day, but in future we need to store it. Lithium is a very lim limited source, it will always be. And looking into uh, Austria and Switzerland, uh, they store the energy in big water reservoirs. We have water on top of Table Mountain, only for Cape Town. There's enough uh, in Johannesburg, you know, we've got enough, enough mountainous terrain to store that energy in water reservoirs and using yeah. it in the night. Yeah. So all of that, you know, hasn't been discussed yet. I like very much your idea of, you know, of the blockchain based uh, uh, small independent energy producers, almost yeah. like it's, uh, it reminds me to, you know, when the, when the township starting to produce their own veggie garden, you know, something like this. So uh, from from the steam machine time, where there's one big power plant, we're going back into taking the power back. Yeah. But we need to store the power and, and think big. Because South Africa, Southern Africa, can be the biggest energy producer in the world. Absolutely. And that I would to like to end up with. Yeah. I just want to thank you, before I give you any answers, is thank you for, for two things. Number one, your optimistic view. Absolutely, I believe adversity breeds creativity and it breeds solutions. And, uh, Definitely there is a positive or a silver lining that we can see on this. And secondly, I really want to thank you for bringing up the water reservoirs because I, I really wanted to speak about that tonight and I didn't get a chance. So this feeds into what Kevin was talking about, about ESCOM absolutely still has a role, right? And I'm not going to sit here tonight and say that, you know, we, do, we absolutely don't need ESCOM and we, we do need ESCOM, but their role will shift slightly. One of the major hurdles in terms of solar is batteries. Lithium ion is not the way forward. It is very environmentally uh, uh, impactful. Uh, and the batteries just, you know, in, as, as much as the cycles have improved, they're not at the level of solar yet. It's not the way forward. If we go and we put solar on every rooftop and every individual is a producer of power, ESCOM's role or the government's role can shift towards energy storage. And energy storage on a large scale like that is a lot more doable. We have reservoirs here in Cape Town, like you said, and maybe just to explain it to the audience who don't know, what we can do is when we've got tons of solar in the day, we use that energy, the excess energy, to pump water up into uh, a height in the mountain or in a reservoir, whatever that is. And then at night time, we've got no sun, we're not producing any energy, oh no, not a big deal. We just let the water flow back down, gravity does the work for us. As it flows down, it spins some turbines and we're providing energy uh, back into the grid. So that's a way to solve sort of what they call the duck curve uh, uh, problem. And that's a much better problem, I think, for ESCOM or for a government, more, more central entity to solve. The energy production problem can be put in the hands of individuals and it can be decentralized and it can be uh, democratized. So exactly what Aaron was talking about, Steenbrust Dam does exactly that for Cape Town and it's why Cape Town frequently is one or two stages of load shedding lower than the rest of the country. But Long term, we don't have, so let me back up a step. Pumped storage is the gold standard of storage globally because it's cheap, it's renewable, it's easy to do, but we don't have a lot of sites that are suitable for pumped storage because you've got to have a high reservoir and a low reservoir. And you've got to pump from the one to the other and, and, and gravity feed. But what we do have is this. We have a lot of empty mine shafts, abandoned mine shafts, now, if you imagine, you flood a lower level of a mine, okay, and you put the pump at the bottom, and when you've got electricity, you pump it to the high level of the mine, and when you haven't got electricity, you gravity feed it down back to the bottom again. We've got a lot of those mines. We've got the deepest mines in the world here in South Africa, and we've got a problem with illegal mining, uh, the Zama Zamas. So there's a lot of, there's, obviously we'd have to look at, at how we seal those shafts and things like that, but it's easy to do. It's not rocket science. These are the kind of innovative things that we need to look at. How do we store energy? How do we make use of energy? Just to touch on your hydrogen thing, um, there's a big hydrogen project taking place at Saldana. There's a big hydrogen project taking place in the Northern Cape at uh, Buhubai. Um, those are both blue and green hydrogen projects. And so it is very much on the, on the um, cards for South Africa to be a major player in the hydrogen space. Okay, I'm going to ask everybody else just to 
because we're going to wrap. I mean, some of us need to go, not us. I'm way too young to go to bed early, but um, some of us want to go to bed, right? So, uh, but it's been a great panel. Any other comments from you guys? No? And just for the record, we have journalists here. He was not suggesting that we flush the Zama Zamas out of the mine. <laughs> No, um, <laughs> no, no, listen, just trying to help you out here. Um, <laughs> all right, we, we, we don't really have time for another question, but... The panel's here. We'll, we'll be here afterwards. All right, guys, can I just do one? It has to be quick, please, if you don't mind, because we're out of time. Ma'am, thank you very much. Okay, so I just have a question um, regarding the key solar um, power system up in Uppington, which uh, obviously produces uh, solar power to 120,000 households in Uppington. Is that not something that we could implement in other cities? Because it's, it's, it's quite an amazing project as far as I'm concerned. Do you know anything about that project? So that, that project is part of a program, a government program called the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producers Procurement Program. And what happened was there were four, so South Africa was at the very forefront of the, uh, of the renewable energy um, kind of race globally with this Independent Power Producers Procurement Program. And we went through four bid windows, and then we got to 2015, and Brian Malefe and Michelle Coco took over at ESCOM. Now, part of that program is that they have to sell their, their electricity to ESCOM. They have to have a power purchase agreement with ESCOM. And when Michelle Coco and, and Brian Malefe took over at ESCOM, they said, we're not buying from independent power producers anymore. So we went for seven years where those projects, certainly the bid window four projects, one, two, and three, uh, were, were concluded by that stage, but bid window four, they, they couldn't actually conclude because they didn't have power purchase agreements. That's now been kick-started again, and we are busy rolling out new bid windows, but we've got a problem, and the problem is this. Solar is primarily in the Northern Cape, and wind is primarily on the southern coast of the Western Cape and then into the Eastern Cape. We don't have enough evacuation capacity on our grid to take that where it's needed. In other words, we can't transmit the power from a, solar, a new solar farm in the Northern Cape to Gauteng where they need the electricity. We have that problem. So we've got to invest in our grid infrastructure. But it is something that is happening and it is something that, that is rolling out quite quickly actually. Um, and, and, and the pricing of, of both solar and wind, the, the price per kilowatt hour that, from those farms has dropped significantly to the point where it is now cheaper than uh, either coal or nuclear in South Africa. Okay. I almost said order, honorable member. You went over your time. But thank you. <laughs> Listen, thank you very much to everybody for being here. But let's hear it for the panel, please. Thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you, Tiger. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Aaron, for the great work you're doing. And now let's pretend this is the end of a sting or any one of those other concerts, please. Please make some noise for yourselves. Thank you very much. Here's to the future. <laughs>